Segment two, Darwin. <clears throat> Good old boy. Good old boy. The Devil's Delusion. Quote, quote. This is quite a quotation. It's only a few words, but it's... Packs a punch. Yes, it does. Two of them, I think. Suspicions about Darwin's theory arise for two reasons. The first, the theory makes little sense. The second, it is supported by little evidence. Close quote. All right, let's take those one at a time. Evolution makes little sense. Evolution is in the air. It's so widely accepted. It's what? in the air of the New York Times, that's for sure. And it's in the mouth of every evolutionary biologist. But that doesn't exhaust the cosmos. Uh, let so me ask the, you a question. If those two propositions, you were to exceed, were completely true, would it change your mind? That, that, that those are the two quotations. That evolution makes little, the theory makes little sense in and of itself, and it's supported by little evidence. David, it wouldn't change my mind because I'm so completely on your side. On ah, this well, I mean, if you were on the other if side. If I were on the other side, yes, but I would do everything I could to, I mean, that, that's sort of, sort of yeah. like the vampire But approach. I assure stop, you, it, stop, it would change no one's mind. And oh, that's really? the curious thing about the discussion. Do you think it would change Richard Dawkins' mind? Mm. Or but, Sam but, but, Harris? But let me, why do you say that the theory in itself makes so little sense? Well, what's it say? Whatever survives, survives. No, I knew that before. Because it's I didn't even have to study Darwin. It's tautological. It's empty. It's empty. It's empty. It doesn't tell us anything. Yeah, survives. survives. I'll believe that. But that's not a theory. That's just a, a string of wet sponges on a clothesline. That doesn't tell us anything deep about biological structure. Yeah, a lot of variations. Children don't look exactly like their parents, thank goodness. And their children will be slightly different too. But does that tell us why startling, complex structures arise in the history of life. No, well, it doesn't have anything to do with this it. Is, it is supported by little evidence. Now that, I have to say, did startle me to hear you say that evolution is supported by little evidence. What is the, the evidence that's forever being introduced? Well, there's I the I can tell you, b b little boy, father took me to the Museum of Natural History in New York, there it is over on the west side of Manhattan, yeah. and all the plaques say that said then, what they say now, which is this dinosaur came at such and such, and is it such and such a period? And there are charts on the wall saying somehow or other how we got from those dinosaurs to creatures that are alive today. That's Not the evidence. Not And there are arrows connecting the creatures. Indeed there are. Hmm. Where were the arrows discovered? <laughs> that the museum won't tell you. There is such a load of inferential adjustment made in even the most plausible evol evolutionary sequence. I mean, take a reptile to battle. That's a beautiful evolutionary sequence. It looks like one organism is being slaughtered right after the other. And tremendously interesting changes where bones in the jaw migrate to become the three bones in the ear. The structure of the mouth changes completely. And that's the best. Or the whale sequence, you know, some sort of terrestrial animal becomes a whale over roughly nine million years. But that doesn't amount to an elaboration of anything more than the discovery of fossils that could be slotted in an evolutionary way, could be. But what we lack is the analytic refinement to tell us whether they are or have been slotted in this way. It is simply an exercise in conditional plausibility. Yeah, it could have happened that way. No one on my side of the table is saying, no, it's impossible that it happened that way. What we're saying is that the evidence is remarkably, remarkably constrained, meager, insufficient, inadequate, and lacking all forms of analytic sufficiency. Well, so. I'm on your side, but your strength, but I, uh, overwhelming I, 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 I sort of, no, I feel the impulse to be on your side. I hadn't thought it through in anything like this. So how is it that evolution, that Darwin comes along and within what seems like 27 seconds, he's carried the field, that is to say intellectually, in the academy. He's just carried the field. By the turn of the 20th century, uh, Darwin is the dominant way of looking at the evolution of species, the development of species. How did that happen? I mean, I can see that it's taxonomically useful, that you, it gives you a way of putting fossil yeah. bones in order. You can, now you have a filing cabinet, you understand what could lead to another, but, but How it, surely did there's it more. How happen that Marxism swept its field, swept it so thoroughly and completely that a hundred million people had to die before someone realized, you know, that's not such, such a swell theory at all. That theory may have certain problems. Now, the same Gravelman doesn't stand against Darwin's theory, but let's face it, 
academics throughout the Western world form a native conspiracy class. And they are very akin to a criminal class. They'll believe anything. And once they believe something, the conspiracy is held tenaciously. And for, for what were very good reasons, Darwinian theory was accepted in the academic world way before it entered public relations world, the world of the media, world of right. newspapers or television. And it was accepted because it was a form of power. It was an advantageous acquisition to be able to say, well, you guys out there in the Bible Belt don't understand a thing, but we understand life. Uh, knowledge is power in the academic world, and that was a devastating acquisition, the more so since it allowed academics to participate in a cultural war against religion, a rival center of power. Richard Dawkins, one of the most prominent mm -hmm. atheists of the day, quote, although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. What do you make of that? Well, it depends what they're filled with, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, put, the, put the most charitable. What, do, what, what is he getting at? People With respond Darwin, to Dawkins. The books sell. They, oh, yeah. That quotation, you just type in Richard Dawkins plus, and this quotation comes up 10,000 times yeah, on Google. Yeah. It gets, it's, it, why do people respond to this? Darwinism provides a mythological framework for a scientific theory. It provides an account of human origins provides an account of biological origins, provides an account of change. And that account at every point is the substitute for a biblical account. That is, the, the accounts that we had all been led to believe, say, before 1859 were essentially biblical. They began, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. To be an atheist before Darwin, Richard Dawkins is arguing, would be to leave unexplained, the very point that the Bible or the Christian Jewish tradition does explain, the origins of life. In terms of that tradition, the origins of life occur because God breathed upon inert, inactive matter and created life. For the first time, Darwin seemed to provide a framework in which that wasn't necessary. Or more precisely, it wasn't necessary in as far as an alternative miracle was available. That is the miracles currently being promoted for the origins of life. It is a creation myth without a creator. That's right. All right. 